this section of scripture is probably so familiar to you that you don't need me, right? Uh, I mean, you 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 know the story. You know what's happening in this chapter. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you can go home, right? <laughs> uh, and David is. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, it's, it's outlined in our lesson book as receiving God's word. That's the title of the lesson. And so it focuses more on the soils than the sowing. Okay? The way the lesson is set up, it focuses more on the soils than the sowers. Its outline is God's truth is revealed to those willing to accept it and practice it. Verse chapter 13, 1 through 17. It continues, those who accept and practice God's truth will bear fruit. Do you remember? And this this is an aside that took me down a rabbit's path. Uh, do you remember a hymn in the old hymnals that has to do with sowing and reaping? Mary. Yeah, bringing in the sheaves. Uh, it's kind of interesting that that hymn was written by a restoration um, restorationist preacher. He based the text of the hymn on Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Uh, about a person going forth in the morning with weeping and sowing, but bringing, and in the time of harvest, coming with rejoicing. So looking at this from the sower's point of view, much of the seed that he sows is lost. Right? There's only one soil that the seed makes any progress with, if you will. Three fourths of it is lost. That's kind of discouraging, isn't it? But the one fourth that produces produces fruit. So we might need to think about that. Now, when we come to chapter 13, Jesus changes his method of teaching. He changes his method to teaching primarily to parables. Now, that doesn't mean that he hasn't told parables before. In the Sermon on the Mount, he told a parable. He told the parable of the builders. The one built his house upon the rock, and the other one built his house upon the sand. The point that he was making is if you build your house up on my teachings, are the teachings of God, then you'll have a stable house. If not, it's unstable. Yes, God. I have um, a reference to Genesis chapter, um, chapter 26, verse 12. Yeah. And it says, Let Isaac sow the seed of the land and reap the same a hundredfold. Yes. And that was, that is an unusual 
occurrence. That was because God blessed. Uh, I'm, I read something uh, related to this that generally it was only about ten, uh, tenfold of, of a uh, harvest that they would expect. So let's think about why Jesus, by the way, what is a parable? An early story of a heavenly meeting. Yes, and that's a workable definition. Uh, but there's things in, in that are considered parables that we really don't think of. We think more of them as proverbs or riddles. Uh, Josh used one this morning. Where Jesus said, I have come to call sinners to repentance. Or the part about the doctor. Uh, you know, he, he makes the point that it's not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. And then he applies that. I have called, come to call sinners to repentance, not the righteous. And first of all, you've got to see that you are a sinner to be able to be called. Okay, so the parables and, um, you know, we often think that Jesus told the parables to make his teachings clear. But that may not be the case. His own explanation may indicate otherwise, especially verses 10 through 17. And uh, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to them it has not been given. Uh, so what he's saying is these spiritual truths would only be clear to those who are willing to accept him on his terms. Him on his terms. And if you look at Mark's account of this, he's even more blunt with the way he puts it in Mark 4, uh, 10 through 12. And that might be uh, worth looking at. Mark 4, 10 through 12. Right. Chapter. When he was alone, those who were around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. So, does he really mean that he doesn't want them to understand? No. And this is based on Isaiah 6. Uh, Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, I think. Yes. And this is a passage that gets lots of quotation in the New Testament. Uh, it's quoted again in Acts 28, 23 through 28, and may be echoed. In Romans 12, uh, 11, 
It's quoted in John 12, 39 through 41. And then, of course, each time that this parable is told in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. So what's Jesus mean by using this? Let's think about where he's at. Opposition to Jesus has increased at this point. That will be discussed in uh, another lesson. So in Matthew's gospel, Jesus had taught throughout Galilee in the synagogues. That's mentioned in chapter 4. It's mentioned in chapter 9, verse 35, and in Luke 11, 1. I mean, in Matthew 11, 1. <laughs> At this point, opposition to his teaching is on the rise. Beginning in 9, chapter 9, verses 2 through 8, he is charged with blasphemy. In chapter 9 uh, through 13, uh, he uh, the charge of blasphemy. He associated with the wrong type of people. 934, his miracles of healing are attributed to Beelzebub. Chapter 11, verses 20 through 24, his deeds of power were rejected in the cities that he taught in. So they didn't. And the way they were rejected is that they did not lead to repentance. And so in chapter 12, you have the Sabbath controversies. At 1214, there is a plot to kill him. In verse 24, he cast out demons and the casting out of demons is said to be by the power of demons, Beelzebul, or Satan himself. At this point, the synagogues are not close to him completely. Oh, by the way, you can add that his family came to take him away because they thought he was crazy. So opposition to his ministry has risen. So telling parables are stories, are most of them are stories that are interesting. But the words of the stories cannot be used against him. Does that make sense? Being careful. Yes, yeah. being careful. So his words to the Pharisees, sometimes sometimes a parable is a trap. You know, the famous one in the Old Testament is Nathan to David. Uh, the one in that Jesus uses is the parable of the vineyard. Story, but yet they are trapped because of what conclusion they have to reach. You might also look at the Good Samaritan that way too. Um, so they can't trap him. But maybe somebody wants to use his ministry as rebellion against Rome. The Zealots, for instance, are the Sicarii, and they may be the same group. But they can't use his words either to support their political idea. Jesus is not 
fitting the messianic belief of the time. So, why does he tell parables? Uh, it keeps him out of direct conflict. It keeps his words from being misused. He tells parables according to Psalm 78, verse 2, as fulfillment of prophecy, and uses Isaiah 6, 9 through 10 as another prophecy, saying the people are like the people of Isaiah's day. Now, Consider Isaiah 6 for a moment. This is his call to being a prophet. He sees God or a vision of God. He's high and lifted up, God is. And the question is asked, who should I send? So God is sending a messenger to his people. But he gives Isaiah a warning. They will hear, but they will not listen. They will see, but they will not perceive. Now, was it because Isaiah's teaching was too sophisticated, too hard to understand? No, if you look at Isaiah 28, uh, well, I didn't write the verses down. But in Isaiah 28, I think it's 9 and 10 there also, are starting around 9 and 10. The people that were in power thought his message was too simple. They thought he should be teaching kindergartners in the way, line by line, word for word, precept on precept. They were saying, you know, his message of relying on our God doesn't fit the nation's situation of dealing with Assyria. People didn't want to hear. Didn't want to hear. So if you're in that boat of not wanting to hear, in the boat of not wanting to hear, it becomes less clear, less penetrating, less understandable. It becomes, as in the case of Isaiah, too simple to believe. And we can apply that to lots of things. If you look at the book of Romans, chapter 1, there's a line in there that said, their thinking became darkened, and they became fools. And for things like the creation, they have other explanations. They do not acknowledge God. So, their thinking becomes foolish and darkened. You know, Drew, I think that the crux of the matter is that you got Israel, which has a history of, in their minds, they thought they were chosen. Mm -hmm. So they're dealing with that. And Pharisees' rejection of Christ. 
the historical thing is, is that you can sort of calls you out and return. Yeah. And you either reject or you accept. You either and that's the crux of the whole thing all, all through this. We have a responsibility to make a decision one way or another. Yes. Yeah. We have a responsibility to make a decision. And this is basically what this um, uh, lesson is about. Uh, again, only those open to the teaching of God understand its value and meaning. There's a, a passage uh, on page 61 in the teacher's guide of this book that I think is worth reading. The word of God will challenge our understanding and call us to change to fit the nature of God in whose image we are created. If we are unwilling to allow God to reshape us as he sees fit, then we will ultimately reshape God, truth, and the standards of life to fit our desires. This is how something extremely dangerous is embraced. Humility is an essential element in properly receiving the word. We must look for and listen to what is there, not what we want to find. Thus, we need for humility. The need for humility also extends to interpretation. I think that's a very important statement to think about. You know, accepting the word, not only the written word, but the living word as it is presented. Don't try to reshape it into what you want it to say. Because you reshape God, you reshape truth, and that becomes dangerous. That becomes dangerous. This parable, we finally get to it, it's explanation. It's a simple story, right? It deals with two aspects of growing a crop. Just two. The sowing and the harvesting. It doesn't say anything about the rain. It doesn't say anything about plowing the ground. It just talks about the sowing and the harvesting. The seed, a sower sows his seed. Seed land on four types of soil. This parable uh, comes closer to being an allegory than any of the other parables because the soils mean something. They mean something. The sower goes forth, he sows seed, they land on four types of soil, hard, rocky, thorny, and good. Only the seed that so falls on good soil produces a crop, 30, 60, 100 fold. And depending on which uh, uh, version of the Gospels that you read, one version lists it 100 60, 30 fold instead of that. So who's the sower? In, the, in one of the following parables, 
it will be Jesus himself in the parable of the wheat and the tares, which is also in this chapter. But it can be just someone who teaches someone else the gospel. Disciples. And this may, this may have as a secondary meaning a message to disciples. As you go and as you share, some will not will not hear you. Yeah. They will not hear you. Some will hear you and it looks like you've got a good response. But they have no depth. Others Look like they've made a good start also. But things of this life crowd out the gospel. Then the fourth type is those that Produce the crop a fruit. Now, we can think about this a, a, a little more about the sower being a teacher. And uh, if you have the Apocrypha somewhere, you can look up 2nd Ezra 9 30 through 33, where God is presented. As sowing the law in Israel. Now, at the time, this is the usual way of a crop was planted in Israel at that time. God went forth with a bag of seed, and he would reach into the bag of seed and he would throw it. It would land on various places. The plowing, and maybe a better word is harrowing, came afterwards, which put the seed into the ground where it could grow. In Mark's gospel, he starts this in an interesting way. In Mark chapter 4. He starts the parable with the word. Listen. He starts the parable with the word. Listen. All three of the gospels. In the parable. With words like this. He who has ears to hear. Let him hear. So, back to the point, the story is all about listening. How do you listen? How do you listen? So maybe we should talk about what, yes, Chris. I may be blowing my eyes, but ultimately, I would think that we believe that God will give the increase. Yeah. You know, I think it's saying that seeds don't fall on all kinds of ground. Yes. Uh, now, I sort of feel like maybe the context of this is he may be talking to the Pharisees more. It's a, a little troubling that, in my mind, I keep. This may be one of those favorable things, like you need to be hard to start. Mm -hmm. 
it sort of comes across that way a little bit. Uh, I, I think you're right. <laughs> and it a whole lot more to think about there. Uh huh. But I don't know. I think for the disciples, if he's communicating with them, uh, they're going to get this later on in the Gospels, the Acts, and the Romans, and everything, where they encounter these same needles over and over. And he said, Check it up, he can go to another place. Yeah. So, you know, it's a. There's a, a concept that my Bible study fellowship. Uh, leader point that he made one time for many people it takes seven and a half times to hear the gospel before they respond and his point in this in this teaching is we should present it or be such a person that the next person has an easier time of presenting. Does that make sense? Yeah, many times we don't see the fruits of our labor. Uh, a seed that we sow, we may never see that person come to Christ, but but they come later because of the groundwork that I laid that someone else built upon that yes. someone else added to, and there's, and there's the problem. Yeah, and going back to Chris's point, God gives the increase. That's what Paul said in, he planted Apollos water. God gives the increase. That's a good point, Chris. <laughs> so, the pathway. Uh, well, let's talk about the seed. In the parable, the seed is described in Mark 4.14 as the word. The word of God in Luke 8.11. Um, in Matthew, it's either the message of the kingdom or the word of the kingdom. 13.18. Uh, in other passages, James uh, 2.21, the word, the engrafted word, is what saves you. Now, not the word specifically within itself, but what the word contains. The message about Jesus. This is able to save your soul. First Peter 2, 23 tells us we need the word to grow. We need the word to grow. The pathway was the person who hears the word, the message of the kingdom, but is not receptive. There's no real interaction. It's surface level contact only. Uh, this may be the person who studies the word academically sometimes. And they have questions. They always have questions. Where can he get his wife? Uh, you know, the wicked one comes and takes it away. If we look at Second uh, uh, Corinthians four three through four, he blinds. If we look at Second Corinthians eleven, he deceives. The rocky ground, shallow soil, covers the rock. It's not that there's rocks in the soil. It's just the surface. There's no place for the roots to grow. In this case, um, 
there is no spiritual growth because when trouble arises, they fall away. For some reason, they see that Jesus is not popular. His teaching is not popular. It doesn't fit in with our culture. So, they lack rooting. They fail to carry the cross. They fail to count the cost. And then the teaching becomes hard. Like in John 6. The thorny ground has some of the same aspects. Except that they are caught by Issues of life. Dealing with life. It's choked out. And we think about such passages as 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, which talks about people who uh, seek to become rich. Or we think about uh, such passages as Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve both God and money. Then you come to the good soil that produces the crop. Matthew, the person hears and understands the word. Mark, Mark 4.20, he hears and accepts it. Luke, Luke 8.15, he hears the word, holds it fast in an honest and good heart and bears fruit with endurance. I think those last key words, he hears it, with an honest and good heart and bears fruit with endurance. Now, what is the fruit? Uh, on surface, we may say other Christians, and that would be a fruit. Uh, perhaps also we should look at things like Galatians 5, 22 through 26. That talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Do you see those things in people's lives? Are they growing in those things? Kindness, love, joy, peace, self control. That may also be a fruit that he's thinking about too. 